everyone and happy to see um, this on? Okay. I said good evening to everyone. We are happy and delighted that you're here. We're going to have um, an abbreviated membership meeting for um, this evening. And if we finish this, then we, we have to take care of some important matters. Now, I was expecting to have many more people because we sent out announcements to the churches and to the schools and so forth. But a lot of the people tonight at my church, and I'm um, sorry that I couldn't even attend, one of our vital members, Reverend Samuel Hopkins, is being funeralized at 7 o'clock. So that's where a lot of the um, persons that had planned to come are attending the funeral. And I'm pretty sure they said they're going to try to make it, but... Uh, I know it's going to be a long funeral because he was a very dedicated um, person of the church for many years, 25 years, at Cornford Missionary Baptist Church. But nevertheless, um, I had asked Dr. Campbell more than uh, two, about a month ago, uh, if he would come, the Educational Committee uh, is sponsoring Dr. Campbell. That is one of their projects. We try to have we have an education committee, we have a legal redress committee, we have a um, health committee. Uh, there are five or six committees, and this is the, uh, tonight is the education committee. And I thought that uh, after reading many of the things that I read about Dr. Campbell, that this would be useful uh, in our area. So um, I know there will be people coming in a little bit later, but Jeffrey does always give us a hard time if we're not out here by 9 o'clock. <laughs> he, he said he should take the key if we get out by 9 because he won't, we won't need a key anymore. <laughs> so we're going to make him out a tail. <laughs> okay, so uh, at this particular time, I would have our educational chairperson introduce Dr. Uh, Derek Campbell.
within the folder, you'll find a PowerPoint so that you'll be able to follow along, um, as well as some other information. Um, at the end of the presentation, I would like for everybody to fill out the speaker evaluation form and just let me have it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Ms. Green for inviting me here. I'd like to thank the NAACP for having me come to speak here tonight. My topic tonight is promoting positive racial teacher-student classroom relationships. Not everyone agrees that some of our youth are having a racial challenge in the classroom, and so I'm going to review some of those indicators first. This is the uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress data, and if you look, in reading for 9-year-olds, 13-year-olds, 17-year-olds, minority kids lag behind the white students in those areas. This is also true for mathematics, 9-year-olds, 13-year-olds, and 17-year-olds. Okay. Also, this, the uh, United States Department of Education reported that minority students are more likely to be suspended <coughs> from school when compared to white students. And if you notice, the majority representation is our black students. They reported similar results in 2003. Okay. And if we look at suspensions now, what's interesting about New Jersey is they, they're not, they don't have to report suspensions according to ethnicity. But they did report in 2002, 2003 school year to the Department of Education. This came out in 2006, and I made a comparison of I made a comparison of the enrollment as well uh, compared to the number of suspensions. And if you look, um, especially for black students, the suspension rate is very high. Okay. If we take a closer look at Perth Amboy, we notice the Student demographics are majority um, Hispanic culture. Is that better? Okay. And if we look at the language arts statistics, um, the students lag behind the state average as well as the white students in this school district. Now, it doesn't show for fifth grade, and that's because they didn't have enough students that took the test in fifth grade to report. It's the same, the same is true for math and also suspensions. Now, even though there was a major decrease, suspension rate is still kind of high. And we know that most students in Perth Amboy are minority students. If we look at the high school in regards to language arts, proficiency plus, um, you know, uh, the white students did fare better at the school as well as in the state. This is also true for mathematics, and student suspensions are also high at Perth Amboy High School. And so some of these causes, according to researchers, are teacher discrimination, black and Hispanic student beliefs regarding teachers in schools, the racial challenges that schools present for minority students, as well as discrimination in the classroom. Researchers also report that there are cultural differences in verbal behavior, um, cultural communication styles, debating, group discussions. For example, the research indicated that Hispanic students or Hispanic people, they all like to make a decision together, and they will all talk at the same time until a decision is made. And so you can imagine how that may play out in the classroom when a teacher comes to the classroom with a different expectation. Um, that's, it's the same with black students. They like to have a group discussion, OK? I think that's why um, cooperative learning has become so important for our minority students. There's also differences in nonverbal behavior, standing difference, interaction styles, uh, eye contact, for example, um, 
you know, in white culture, they're taught that you have to make eye contact, whereas in the Hispanic culture, they're taught if you're staring at somebody that's holding you, it's disrespectful, as well as in the black culture. So there are differences that teachers and students bring to the classroom regarding their culture, as well as nonverbal and verbal behavior. And so what is the solution? Well, we've tried multicultural education, teacher preparation. We've added a couple of classes to the curriculum of colleges, charter schools, school uniforms, no child left behind, highly qualified teacher, in school suspension. We, we've tried it all. The solution is promoting positive racial teacher-student classroom relationships. One researcher reported that having positive and caring relationships in school increases resilience and protects children from academic failure, mental illness, drug and alcohol abuse, and destructive behavior and violence. Another researcher reported that black students believe their achievement increases when students, when they have positive relationships with their teachers. They also believe that academic performance or poor academic performance results from teachers who lack concern for them and engage in negative gossip regarding them. Another researcher reported that black and Latino urban high school students believe their underachievement results when teachers lack caring interpersonal skills to develop positive relationships. And so I, with all this information, I conducted a study at a local high school, and I can't mention the high school, okay? And so the demographics were, for the administrators, it was 67% uh, white, 33% black. The instructional staff was 95% white, and the student demographics was 60% Hispanic, 33% black, okay? 99% of these students qualified for free or reduced lunch. The student's suspension rate was twice the state average for three consecutive years, and black students accounted for 45% of the process disciplinary infractions while only accounting for 33% of the student population, which means that in regards to disciplinary infractions, Black students were overrepresented. Okay. Teacher student interactions accounted for 70% of the discipline referrals, and within that 70%, most of the disciplinary infractions were classroom disruptions. And so, this is the overall process that was used to promote positive racial teacher student classroom relationships. And this is actually a self-organization process, which was first eh, developed by Margaret Wheatley, which I modified for this intended purpose. And the study actually began with eight teachers and eight students. Okay? I interviewed eight teachers. I interviewed eight students. We talked about how they develop positive relationships. You know, we talked to the kids about how they develop positive relationships. And so I took all this information together, as well as the statistical data, and I developed this diagram. This is called a systemic structure. And what happens is a systemic structure will tell us what the cycle is, what's causing whatever our challenge is. Of course, this challenge was classroom disruptions. And so a student would talk excessively, and this is all on your PowerPoint. And then we have disruptive student behavior. The teacher, of course, would ask for compliance. And it's either going to be verbal or nonverbal. And what we found was most teachers that develop positive relationships with students, they may give them the look, or they may give them chances and choices. Now, this was at this school. I don't know what they may do in a different type of culture. This was at the school that I worked at. 
And so if you had student compliance, of course you didn't have a classroom disruption. But if you had student non-compliance, then you had the classroom disruption. Of course, the teacher has to submit a misconduct, which is evaluated by the AP. And so when the student is a, was assigned a consequence, they decide to be either late for school or be absent for school. And so this can be a cause for student dropout, OK? Because if you're not having success in the classroom and you're you know, involved with a lot of discipline, you know, what's the point of going to school now? I might as well find me something else to do. It also, we also noticed that the more a student was involved in a classroom disruption, the more their grades decreased. And I've actually, as a teacher, I've actually had kids that would work hard to get a D. And so now, you know, this child is a classroom challenge, and they're working hard to get a D. This is going to show up in my test scores or my standardized test scores. And so that's that's a cycle that we have to deal with. You know, and, and we have to rid the school districts of this type of cycle. Okay? And so that was the first step. And so I met with eight teachers after that, and we started meeting. We met five times that year. And in the first meeting, we developed a personal vision, and then as a team, we developed a shared vision. And for this model, this is what gives us what we call self-identity. The information that was given to them was, of course, the case study results. And then there was a literature review on the student-teacher behavior and all those different aspects, as well as an urban student verbal and nonverbal classroom behavior. And so the output was improved racial teacher-student classroom relationships. And what we would do in those meetings is we would decide, as a team, what strategies that the teachers were going to go in the classroom and try to use with the students to work with them culturally. And, and they started doing wonderful things. For example, and it started validating what the district was doing. You know, they would, for example, they would do um, test-taking skills. Now, we assume that a teacher is going to do test-taking skills anyway, OK? But it added value when they saw that, you know, it helped them out culturally. And they started excelling in their classroom. And so this was the entire process. And that's the model for Now, these are the results. There were three different categories of teachers. <coughs> One category was teachers that participated in the whole process, OK? And this was the overall impact of the discipline in their school. There was a negative 297% change. That's how much their discipline decreased, OK? There were some teachers that we asked to come to our meetings and be speakers, OK? And they would speak on the processes that they use in the classroom. For example, there was one teacher, actually two teachers, that were having challenges with their ninth graders after lunch. And if anybody is a teacher, they know that the after lunch class is probably your worst class or your most active class. And so they decided to have the students and the teacher work together to make the rules in the classroom. And so the discipline just stopped. OK, that was one teacher. And so overall, they had a negative 200% decrease in disciplinary infractions. And then there were some teachers that just came to me and they wanted to know, you know, Mr. Campbell, what's going on? You know, what are you all doing? And so I shared the information with them. And they, you know, they could do what they wanted with the information. And they had almost a negative 400% decrease in their disciplinary infractions. Now, this is the interesting part of this, okay? Open defiance decreased across the board for all students. And open defiance is when, say, a teacher asks um, a student to comply in the cafeteria. You know, pick your tray up and put it in the trash. And the student decides to make this a big scene in front of all the students and everybody in the cafeteria. And that's what we call open defiance. So there was a major decrease. And what that indicated was, and this is the total stat, 
what that indicated was staff and students really started respecting each other. Okay? Classroom disruptions, there was a major decrease for the white students at the school, as well as there was a minor decrease for Hispanic students and a slight increase for black students and a small increase for Asian students. And then disrespect for a, toward the teacher leveled out except for an Asian student. And so when I looked at this data, it really alarmed me. You know, and I said, well, is this process really working? And so I divided the data according to teaching staff and substitutes. And if you look, it was actually the impact of the substitute teachers that brought the data all the way up. Okay? And it makes sense because the students really don't have the time to develop relationships with new substitute teachers. Also, you know, a substitute teacher is a different perspective. You know, I come into your classroom, I'm substituting today, do what I tell you to do, and I need for you to do it now, okay? Because these are the instructions that, that were left with me. So it makes sense. Now, this is what was really important. The impact on student classroom achievement. Now, for the teachers that just spoke in our meeting, they had decreases every grade level across the board. The teachers that were given the information only, they had increases in assigning below average grades and decreases in assigning A's as well as average grades. But look at the teachers that participated in the process. The achievement in their classrooms went way up and students, you know, they were above average, most of them, okay? And so what, really, what it really speaks to is how we operate as educators, because what we will do is we will bring in people to speak and do professional development. We will give teachers information, you know, we'll give them books. But when we include teachers in a process that allows them to change and to change without getting defensive, you know, a lot of times, um, an administrator may say, well, you know, this was the strategy or this is the initiative that the district had and you're not doing this uh, initiative, so I'm going to give you a lower than normal evaluation. And so naturally, as a human, you become defensive and then you go get your union rep, okay? And so now the change never happens and the children are the ones who suffer, okay? I think unions are great. I think people's rights need to be protected. But we need to give teachers a process where they don't have to become defensive, where they can feel comfortable with change. They can feel comfortable that there will be no reprisals. And that's why this process was so important. It's a self-organization process. And I actually had very influential people on my team. You know, and I'm, when I say influential, they influence the culture. And they never felt defensive as the administrator when they decided that they wanted to attempt a certain strategy, even if it didn't work because they had administrative support, you know, of course I could put the patch on, okay? But that's what the teachers need today. They need that process to be able to change. And so overall, we had a negative five point Two percent, and this is after one. This is after one year, a negative five point two percent decrease in process uh, disciplinary accounts. Black students was negative four point five percent. Hispanic students was a negative approximately eleven percent. There were decreases in open defiance for black and Hispanic students. Disrespect for a teacher decreased in regards to Hispanic students. Open defiance and disrespect for teaching. And the teachers, this was what, this was the change in which they reported, okay? And so that's also another indicator that they were working with the kids. Now remember, this is a staff of 72 teachers and only eight teachers participated on the team. Benefits, of course, there's increased student achievement, decrease in student involvement in disciplinary infractions, Parent decrease in visits regarding academic and, dis and or disciplinary challenges. And these are some of the, well, for teachers, there was increase in instructional time. And this is one of the quotes that a teacher gave me. 
Just a note to let you know that I felt that the promoting positive teacher-student class relationship group was a positive thing in our school. I personally wish more teachers were involved. I thought of it as a type of professional development, which it was, where sharing of ideas was the main goal. I think everyone likes hearing stories about other teachers and their students, and I know teachers like telling their stories. Okay? The most useful meeting was the one where we discussed academic disciplinary choices. I learned a couple of tips for allowing students to make choices or at least control choices. And so that teacher was to the point where it wasn't, I'm just going to hammer you because you're a student and you're going to submit to my authority. You know, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to attempt to respect you as an individual. Now, it may not work out that way, but at least you can say and you can go back and tell your friends that at least I did try to work with you, okay? Another teacher wrote, I recently had the opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with a student. She was upset about the detention that I assigned for her earlier in the day. During our talk, it became clear to me that I had treated her unfairly. That's huge for a teacher to come out and say that to a student. Um, we were able to resolve our issues because we both had mutual, mutual respect for each other. When dealing with students, sometimes it's best to be quiet and just listen to what they are saying. That could mean more to them than any advice or instruction. And I have one more. This is very important. This was a second year teacher. There was information from the meetings I attended that helped with student relationships. The biggest item that stands out for me is when it was discussed that most students that are disciplined problems also have failing or poor grades. I checked into mine. It was true. Several of my biggest offenders ended up getting classified as special needs. This is in high school. During the year, and they were moved out of my class. But those few that did not switch out, I changed my way of thinking and tried to get them to be more successful academically so their behavior would be less disruptive in class. I changed my way of thinking. And see, that teacher had a process that was non-punitive to change her way of thinking. And that's what has to happen. And there's some benefits for administrators. Decreased time for processing disciplinary infractions and increased opportunities for instructional leadership. You know, at the school I was at, I couldn't believe the discipline that was coming across my desk. And I said, something, you know, has to be done if I'm going to get in those classrooms and start, you know, giving those teachers the instructional leadership that they may need. So there's our solution. Cultural relationship tra training program that promotes positive racial teacher-student classroom relationships. Are there any questions?